OTB's The Hurling Pod with Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship. Come along, it is the Hurling Pod after the last weekend of the regular section of the National Hurling League. We have the semi final lineup. It's going to be a repeat of last year's final where Limerick take on Kilkenny. That's going to be in Cork this Saturday afternoon. And then on Sunday, we've got a Munster Derby between Clare and Tipperary. The Hurling Pod is brought to you, of course, by Borgosh Energy. They are the proud sponsors of the All Ireland Senior Hurling Championship. So I'd like to say All Ireland winners, Paul Murphy, James Geller here. How are you getting on, lads? How's it going, lads? Very good, thank you. How are you? How, are you? How was your bank holiday weekend? We're recording a little bit earlier than normal, and people can <clears> listen this week on podcast, of course. If you're on the radio on News Talk and maybe haven't heard us before, if you listen to us on Off the Ball, we do two pods a week. This is the free pod, which everyone can access, which kind of is a 40 minute roundup of the weekend just gone by. And then we've got our members' pods where we tackle the questions that have been sent in by our subscribers every week. And you can get that this week on Monday because we're going to release both on the same day uh, this week so that's all going to be there for you so if you enjoy what you're listening to or if you're watching us on the Off The Ball YouTube then maybe you'll uh, consider coming back and giving us some repeat business but how was your bank holiday lads? Skell starting with you how was it? Um, I'd like to say it was a quiet weekend but it wasn't (laughs) of course I maybe I might have overindulged a bit William Mm. but last year I am I made it anyway you made it to the recording, which is the main thing, and you were out with the Galway 20s as well. We're in full championship preparation mode at the moment. Yeah, we're heading over. So, obviously, we're playing um, awfully on April 6th. Uh, they play Dublin first in, in their first round game, but we're playing in Tony Moore in uh, so the 6th of April. Three, just under three, week, three weeks. So, like, you're kind of ramping up preparations now and trying to get uh, that bit of match sharpness, which is tricky now with conditions because the weather has been relentless um, nationally. So, any any game we play, it's in, it's in wind and rain, as, as you can imagine. Um and it's just about getting them, getting them sharp, and trying to keep lads injury free, and and uh, kind of limit disruptions. I suppose the, Ra- the Saint Rafe's guys obviously played Saint Kieran's at the weekend, so they're back now. So it's probably the first time this morning was we is that we had everybody, which is tricky at underage level. You know, with minors and twenties, you get there's I won't disruption is the wrong word to use, but you know it's hard to, to grasp your full squad uh, with like they said, the seniors taking some twenties and then schools etc. and colleges. So you imagine we're four months into our, our season, and today is the first day we've had everyone. <laughs> Well, awfully to win at the weekend as well against Limerick, so it's all uh, mm-hmm. coming together nicely ahead of that game. I'm looking forward to seeing you in Tullamore in a couple of Saturdays' time for that game. It should be mm-hmm. uh, should be pretty good. Um, I'm going to guess you had a much more wholesome weekend, Murph, than Scale going on the beer <laughs> for three days. Yeah, I didn't go on the beer for three days. Um, yeah, quite a weekend. Uh, look, I suppose took it handy. Went for a bit of a stroll yesterday, dinner last night. Uh, I, I I suppose we first saw that Skell probably did have a heavy weekend. I think there was one or two Instagram stories going around. They said, right, this one's going for points. The podcast <laughs> might, might, might be a little bit late here this morning. But uh, fair play to you, Skell. You, you talk out regularly, though. You never uh, you never miss a podcast despite having a few points the night before. Jeez, no, no. I have to show up, no matter what happens. You have to show up. <laughs> <laughs> Tenerife is the only thing that costs us an appearance from this year, so we have not for the rest of the season. And yeah, no, admirably, we did change the recording time, but I think three or four different times for this weekend. Uh, but here we are now on Monday lunchtime, putting this together. It'll be available, of course, on Monday on the YouTube as well, if you prefer to watch us than listening to us. Uh, the final weekend, uh, look, I guess it played out as we had expected with the top four positions. Uh, probably the game that was pivotal to what was going to happen in one. B was the draw between Galway and Limerick so Shane O'Brien sent off uh, which left Limerick with a bit to do in the second half against Galway but it was the treble champions from last year who led going into the final stages of that game mm-hmm. uh, took two points from Evan Nyland to rescue a draw for Galway and Salt Hill ultimately the draw wouldn't be enough because Tipperary did their own business away from home against Antrim Jason Ford 12 points Jake Morris scoring 2-2 as they beat Antrim by 221 to 12 points so that meant that Limerick topped the group in 1B with Tipperary in second place Dublin rounding off their campaign against Westmead 222 to 15 points Keno Sullivan with a goal in the second half 1-4 for him in all Fergal Whiteley had scored the first goal earlier uh, David Williams of Westmead finishes the top scorer in 1B of the league after he hit 7 points for Westmead uh, the Lake County's chance is not helped by Aaron Craig being sent off they were 11-6 down at half time and then Dublin made the most of an extra man in the second half. In 1A, well, Cork opened up. Alan Connolly with back-to-back hat-tricks now for Cork. Uh, they scored five goals against Offaly last week, three against Wexford at the weekend. Cork winning by 321 to 115. Twelve different scorers for the Rebels across that game as well. Well, Wexford had to rely entirely, really, on Seamus Casey, who got a goal and nine points. Waterford, just the four points in the second half. Very difficult conditions at Welsh Park. TJ Reid back. 
Eight points for him. Mikey Butler injured. That's the first klaxon of Mikey Butler mentions for this pod. Uh, but Kilkenny winning by 18 points to two goals and nine. And it was two late frees from David Reedy that won the game in Burr for Clare, who topped the group. Clare winning by 23 points to 119 against Softly. Uh, Owen Cahill got 10 points for the faithful in that one. So Clare finished first. Kilkenny finished second. So that means the pairings for the semi-finals this weekend. You've got Kilkenny versus Limerick and Clare against Tipperary. Um, so Murph, probably no great surprises there, really. Uh, with the way the semi-final lineup uh, came in the end but I suppose Clare only feeling three of the players from the All-Ireland semi-final last year you'd understand that Brian Lone was trying to give lads a run out and he'll probably be happy enough that they actually got over the line and got the win on Sunday Yeah absolutely um, you know Offaly have put it up to teams during this league as well um, so I mean when you consider they went down to Wexford really put it up to Wexford had a good start against Kilkenny as well and just I suppose faded away in the last 15 or 20 minutes so for Brian Lowen to put out, um, you know, a, a weaker team or a team without more established players and uh, to still come out with a win, he'll be happy enough. And he acknowledged that, you know, as well after the game that, you know, Offaly will be happy enough to get a game like that as well. And he was able to get a, a run out to a lot of his other players as well. So, look, I think considering they're top of the table, they're undefeated at the moment. Um, and regardless how you've done that, you'll be happy enough. So it's a good way to finish off as well and a good rattle for the extended panel really for Brian Lowen. Yeah, so the three players from the semi-final last year against Kilkenny were Eva Quilligan, Sinamori and Rory Hayes. Uh, they also had some players come in. I already mentioned David Reedy, who held his nerve with those two late frees to give him the win. Aaron Shanner also got some game time. Conor Cleary had come off the bench. And we've been talking throughout the league, really, Scale, about the guys that he's been having a look at. And Brian Lone mentioned afterwards that that was 20 players that he took a look at against Softly in the last round game. You saw the warm up the week before for Shane O'Donnell and for uh, Tony Kelly. So those guys are coming back into the team as well. Is there a feeling that maybe Clare have unearthed a little bit more depth now than they would have had in 2023? Um, I, I, I'd agree with that. I think we, we've mentioned over the last couple of weeks that they have. They have been building and now have built a, a good squad. Um, like when I say a squad, I'm not talking about 17 or 18. I'm talking 20 to 22 or three players that that you can trust to come in and make an influence. Um, like they've they've gone about their business in the league really nicely. When you consider that they've they haven't really fielded just their strongest 15 at all, minus Shane O'Donnell and Tony Kelly, obviously, and and they've used play, players sparingly. So they seem to be going about business really well. And I think you know to go forward, I think there's there's obviously an understanding in clear that. This is a this is probably the best group they've had, you know, since they won the Ireland in 2013, and this is probably the best chance they're going to have, even if you go back to 22 and 23, to take down Limerick. So I think they're there's there's they're grafting really well, they're building nicely, and uh, it'd be very interesting to see how they go in the Munster Championship because they're building well. So yeah, things looking mm-hmm. good for there. Yeah, we'll see how they get on against uh, Tipperary. Tipperary obviously having to deal with a few injuries, including the uh, the news, Murph, for them, unfortunately, that Seamus Kennedy, as we kind of suspected after he went down at Porky Cueve mm. uh, the week before, it was confirmed on Friday that he suffered ligament damage, so he's out for at least six months. I don't know if Owen Connolly is going to be ready for the start of the league either. He went off with an elbow injury in Corrigan Park at the weekend, just gone by. But um, Seamus Kennedy's going to be a big loss, isn't he? Liam Cowles, but afterwards, he was one of those guys that puts out fires for the team. He's got a bit of versatility in his defending as well and um, he's a big loss for championship yeah he is I mean he, he's had a few great years um, just playing really strong hurling really in good form and and like you said the versatility really is a huge thing with him you know he's, he's a man well able to play anywhere 5 to 12 you know um, great physical presence as well you know if you're looking for to inject that bit of physicality matched with a bit of skill um, and, and you know the ability to attack going forward but also defend I mean that versatility is, is, is so important to every team Um and really, I think, I suppose we've seen him over the last few years, you know, grow into this Tipperary team and just become such an established player. So, like, for such an innocuous injury as well, you know, he was kind of standing on his own at the time when it happened. Um, it's just one of those ones, so unfortunate. Not that there's any, I suppose, any good luck to any cruciate injury, but, you know, it was just such a tough one for him to take. So, you know, that that that's a big dent now for Tipperary going forward. Um, look, I'm certain there's lots of players that will want to try and step in and fill that gap, but... You know, he, he's been a great player for Tipperary for the last few years. So, look, disappointing that his year is essentially finished now at this stage. Yeah, on the members pod, we'll dig into big detail on the semi-finals this weekend. But uh, the venues and times for them this weekend, both games are going to be on TG Carr. Half past four on Saturday is the repeat of the final. And it feels like a literal repeat because they're going back to Porky Cueve to play again. Uh, Limerick against Kilkenny. And then Sunday at four o'clock, you've got Clare against Tipperary, which is going to be in a Moor Park in Port Leash, which looked 
very, very heavy conditions at the weekend when they played against Kerry. And there's a lot of games taking place around there. They've also got the Division 2 semi-final between Leash and Down, down for this weekend in Amore Park. But at time of recording, not decided yet whether it's going to be Saturday or Sunday. Uh, having spoken to both camps, they look like it's going to be on Saturday as opposed to a doubleheader on Sunday because the risk of the pitch cutting up if they had two games there. But, Scale, I don't know how you feel about this. Limerick are going to end up playing more in Porky Cueve than the Gaelic grounds this year because they had yeah. to give away games at home. Yeah, it's a, bit, it's, a bit, it's a bit strange, I suppose, but it's just the way the cookies come. I know, I know they're redeveloping their own grounds. Um, but, like, what, what a great facility to go to. <laughs> like, and I think the records, truthfully speaking, is so good in Porky Cueve that it's nearly treated like a home venue at this stage. I don't know if they've been beaten in Porky Cueve. You know, like, uh, in, obviously... In, they, in lost, they lost one game. Do you remember the first round of the Is league? The, Cork, the night this, Yeah, the night the Keane Lynch was coming back against Cork. Okay, so I stand corrected. They haven't beaten once. Yeah. <laughs> so but, that, but that's it. I think they've won all the rest of them. Yeah, uh, but look, the, the, the Limerick are very impressive wherever they go. I, and I I think they're one of those teams as well as, like, that wherever they play, I don't think it really knocks a, a bit out of them. They, they're, they're able to play to their ability in, in every stadium, in every ground they go to. So I just think it's business as usual. Um, And, like, it's, it's two good draws, I think, to be honest, for, for the four teams. They probably have been the four, you could say, form teams of the league, um, and they deserve to where they be. So hopefully, two good games, and we might get a bit of actual exposure of the game this weekend. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as well, go on, go on. Gone. Take, take the floor on that one. So obviously, we only got to see one game on TV at the weekend, which yeah. was Galway against Limerick. I think there was an online offering for the Antrim versus Tipperary game, but just the one game on the standard TV at the weekend, which was the last round of the hurling league. Yeah, and I could, I couldn't. Part of me, like I'm trying to remain civil in this in this, this conversation, because part of me understands like that there, there may have may not have been the most attractive fixtures because of what was on the line. You could say the league was nearly formatted already; the appearance were already done, and the only one that was carrying a bit of weight, you could say, was was Galway versus Limerick, which yes was shown. But I just look at I'm I'm a hurling snob. Will I'm a hurling snob? I want hurling to be on TV all the time. You know, I just think it doesn't get enough exposure, and the league as a whole hasn't been hectic. I think we all admit that, but. That's still no reason not to be showing games. And it's tricky. I, I understand that, you know, RTE, GA, you know, they, they, they have tricky propositions here with the weekend of sport that was in it over the course, over the actual weekend that was in it itself. So, but I just, I don't know, if we're looking at growing the game and, and, and keeping it in the, in the crosshairs of the public, like it needs to be on television far more, or even offer an online service somehow, give people yeah. the option. Yeah, I do wonder, Murph, if this is not really what GA Go should be for, rather than the games where they're going to pull in subscribers for the championship, where if someone has got their season pass, is there not the possibility that you put Waterford Kilkenny onto there or put Tipperary against Antrim on there? I know that Division 1A was already decided and we had a fair idea who was going to finish up in the semi-final spots, but something like GA Go, that's where it can come into its own is on a weekend like just come by. Yeah. Yeah, completely. And I don't think people are asking for um, a huge amount in terms of the quality of the production element of, of what they're getting. It's really just to have a camera on the match to, so they can see the match, particularly when all the games are at a condensed time like they were over the weekend. Like, you know, different times of the, week, of, of the league, we've had Saturday, Sunday fixtures and they've been well spread out and, and people can go to a game or they can watch a game. But particularly when all the games are so, so close together this weekend, you know, just to have a camera at the game, to have something where that if a person wants to go and watch the game or even watch it back, that, that is there. Now, and there was cameras at the games. I mean, obviously, you know, in order to have the Sunday game, there has to be coverage of it at the game. So, you know, maybe why that coverage isn't available to, you know, like that GA Go subscribers, whatever it is, but just that people at least have the option. Okay, they don't have to go and get it if there's a, if there's a fee, but... Nevertheless, at the weekend, I thought I was doing something wrong. I was looking around saying, where are these games? Where are these games? <laughs> oh, like, them. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, I mean, there's other weekends there where there, it, they were just dead rubber games. You can understand that there was they were, they were going to be one-sided games. But we had Cork and Wexford at the weekend. Okay, it turned out to be a, a one-sided game. But that wasn't to be known before the game because both teams, it looked like, was going to be fairly balanced. It just didn't happen to be that way. So, you know, there was games like Kenny Walford again conditions drew that into a bad game but on paper that should have been a decent enough game so I think you know if you're forecasting before this there was good reason to have good games on this weekend in some format and and somewhere that people could watch them Hmm. just an alternate point of view I know we've said the league has been met a couple of times I'm pretty sure that was the title of the members pod last week I got a DM uh, during the week which was just a little bit too late for us when we were recording the pod last week but it comes in from 
a Limerick supporter who's now based in Cork but wanted to stay anonymous says, look, something that's an absolute bake at the moment is the amount of whinging that people are doing about the league. It's happening year after year about the hurling league like clockwork. Social media today after the game between Kilkenny and Clare was riddled with nonsensical moans about the supposed stats of the game and the Clare game against Kilkenny was actually brilliant. The game is gone. It's ruined. People were saying overcoach, throwing the ball, too much gym, the slitter is too light, too many scores, the refs, blah, 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 blah. Some of these complaints are legitimate, like simulation at the moment, but some of the stuff from people who should know better is nonsense. It's been happening every year. People seem to have amnesia about how good the championship has been and are oblivious to the fact that three or four teams look like they've really improved again this year. The championship is shaping up to be savage this year and maybe the lads can remind people to just relax. What do you think, Skell? I think we had the same conversation every year. I think we were talking last week and we were talking specifically about the referees. Um, the referees come into focus during the league as well, uh, where conditions are tough, pitches are tricky, uh, weather is poor, teams are, are are working hard on the training field, obviously, so they're, <clears throat> they're not putting out you know, probably the, the, the best game, best foot forward, and it's hard for referees. But uh, we were saying it only happens in the league. Come the championship, it's like we, we actually for, we forget about it. We, we focus on the game. I think it's very... like. I understand, look, we, we probably take a championship mindset and look at the league. We want the league to match what the championship produces. You know, that's never going to happen. I think every team is the same. They're prepping, obviously prepping for the championship, so they're not going as hard as they can in the league, obviously. So but us as kind of spectators and pundits, etc., we're looking at it going, well, I, I saw Clare play last year in, in, in the Gaelic grounds. You know what I mean? That's the way I want them to play every day or the same way with Galway, etc. But it's not going to happen in the league list. I, I think all the teams in go through a certain amount of loading, you could say, in terms of training. Like Every team is training heavy, trying to build in the miles to the condition to go through, which is a war of attrition of a championship. Like The round robin is, is, is difficult. It's tough. It's like the Six Nations. Like There's ga- games coming quick and fast, and you don't have an awful lot of time to, to prepare. So you take your window, let's say, from January up to April. You work as hard as you can, build, build in the, the condition there, and then get ready for championship. And that all feeds into probably the games in the league not probably being the best part. So, mm. but it's just it's like that. We had the same conversation last year and the year previous, and no doubt we'll be here next year talking about the hurling's not hectic. But it's just it's natural progression. As January through April is is limited enough, and then then the, the full gates open after that. Yeah, I mean, look, I said last week, Murph, and I stand over it. I didn't think that there was much of a bite really to Limerick against Tipperary, which is a game we were kind of all looking forward to after the break. And it just never really ignited. But then you look at some of the games last weekend, like the really heavy pitch at Walsh Park, the windy conditions there were, I think, between Offaly and Clare, where it was genuinely a gale wind in either half. Like That is just the nature of playing games in March, where you're going to get a lot of rain during the week. You're going to have testing conditions. In all likelihood, by the time the round robin of the championship comes around, we'll hope anyway, conditions are going to be a lot better and maybe some of that more attractive, quicker hurling is going to be possible in the better conditions. Well, it will, absolutely. I think the example of the game over the weekend between uh, Limerick and Galway, realistically, I think there was a few options early on for Limerick or there was, there was a few moments early on for Limerick where if the conditions weren't as bad, a few of the, the sequences of play would have came off and they may have got a goal, they may have got a point, but the heavy ball, the heavy ground, the ability, like, I mean, there was, there was one example I saw, I think it was in the first 10 or 15 minutes, Someone tried to let Aaron Galan through. They popped a hand pass out to him. It might have been Adam English or, or Seamus Flanagan tried to pop a hand pass to him. But it was just behind him. But like literally, you know, Aaron Galan wasn't going to be able to get back for that ball because the ground was so heavy he couldn't turn. In summer, he pivots and he gets that ball and he's gone again. So there's so much of the game will change once the ground hardens up. And there was often, you know, there was parts over the weekend uh, where you saw players sprinting for a ball in championship in any ground in the country, you know, once the ground hardens up, that ball is into the hand and they're gone into a sprint and they're in the attack and it's exciting. But how many times over the weekend did we see players running for the ball and they, they, they didn't rise, and as in the ball was stuck on the ground and it just got, you know, and, yeah. and so many of the games descended into just uh, referees having to hop the ball and different things. And, and it just completely changes the, the dynamic of the game. So inevitably, look, once uh, this league is over and, and over the next month, the, the, the pitches will change across the country. The ground will get harder. The weather will just get that bit better and players will start zapping ball around. And naturally, the evolution of it then is it's exciting hurling and suddenly we're back into it and we forget all about the league. But uh, look, I agree with what was said there. Um, part, of, part of it I agree with, but, uh, but where he was just saying in the comment about, you know, we're, we're, we're constantly talking about it. I, it's probably important to stay, you know, talking about it and keep it current. Like if, if, if people don't speak about the quality of the league, um, well, then it'll just be accepted and maybe nothing will ever happen whereby we don't eventually end up with an end product that's really exciting. Because like, uh, if I think about to, to my time playing league matches, 
or leagues or league finals. Like I remember back in 20, I think it was 2014, we played league final with Tipperary and Thurles and it was a brilliant game. You know, even to look back at it in terms of, yes, there were some mistakes and things, but the excitement was there. We're probably heading in a direction now where we might not get a league final like, those league finals again because it's like it's so close to the championship like I know one of the comments and it's not to jump ahead to the members pod mm. one of the comments is that you know Clare and Limerick if they get to a league final which it looks like on form the two undefeated teams will probably get to a league final they're then going to be forced to play the week before they play each other in Ennis now a great a great uh, suggestion was that should the first round double up you know again right. you've just stolen that from the members pod I've stolen we'll answer it now, one I've stolen is, one thing. That, that, that's fine Murph you may answer it now so You're right even Murph. if, You're right if in that circumstance <laughs> they're due to meet in the league final it's right before the championship is due to get underway it seems to me perfectly sensible as that commenter said uh, to us that they actually double it up as the league final now, Will, you did say to us, like, off the ball coached us, and they said, if you can do a little segue into a next part, that segue word was so important that we can do it. Here we are. I've managed to do a segue. Yourself, Jerry Gilroy, and the boys can all be happy. I mean, Seth and Skettle are learning how to do this whole thing. But, uh, yeah. Slowly, well, slowly but surely now. So we're taking, <laughs> slowly but surely. Three years. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's a great suggestion and it's something I hadn't really thought about. We saw it previously with uh, the Welsh Cup between Kilkenny and, and Wexford. I think it was, wasn't Kilkenny and Wexford had it a few years ago or was it Galway? Galway, Wexford, 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 Wexford. Last yeah. year, wasn't it? They had it down in Welsh Park um, yeah. where, yeah, first round of the league. Now, some people may say the emphasis first round of the league in the Welsh Cup, right? But I do think it's a decent suggestion. It's certainly one that should be considered. Um, what, like, what, what will Limerick and Clare go out with? Let's say, again, and this isn't to get ahead of ourselves that these are going to be the league final, but you'd imagine it's it's it it, it will be. Um, you know, it's it's tough for those teams to be going out one week and then going out to find, which game do you put emphasis on? Do you put emphasis do you go on hammer and tongs for both games? First round or, championship. Absolutely first round championship. Well you have like, to, I, yeah. I, yeah. I don't I, I don't care if Clare want to win the league or how much it means yeah. for Limerick to retain. The far more important game with the stakes on it is the championship game the next week. Absolutely. Oh, it is, completely, yeah. yeah. Just, in, just, in, just in the relevancy of the, the league just dissipate when it comes to championship. Completely, yeah. So yeah. I, think, I think it's relevant. And I, I, I can see a situation whereby both sets of management teams would agree, well, not, I, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, to play two games against each other in such close proximity to each other. You know what I mean? They'd yeah. be happy to get one game. Injury yeah. risk, etc. You know. Yeah, exactly. It's actually an ideal scenario to have a, one of the best league finals you're probably going to see in a long time because both teams can go absolutely hammer and tongs at it, come away with a bit of silverware um, at the end of it. But like, you at least get to consolidate all their efforts into one game as opposed to splitting it over yes. two games where yeah. you know they thirty percent focus on the league final, but they. I can't say 100% now with 70% or whatever you want to say. Like they're going to put all their effort into the first round of the championship. That's obvious, you know. But the question mark then lies over well, what can they put into a league final then, you know. Now, this well, is all... I have to ask you, Murph, obviously, when the yeah. Munster Championship, it's Munster Council. Mm. Income, what happens here? Do you know, yeah. do, do, do the league receipts, do they, do they go to the GA headquarters? What happen? Like that's mm. That'll come into it too because we're talking here logically. And you'd yeah. say, right, it sounds logical, you know. Yeah. It should be done, but it mightn't be done. <laughs> it could be. Oh, no, no. No, geez, far from it. Far from it. Yeah. yeah. I wonder what happens, Gail, to kind of switch the question up slightly, is if Tipperary win this Sunday, what's, and say if Limerick were to beat Kilkenny, Tip mm-hmm. got the first week off in the Munster Championship. It's like, do Tip go really hard at it and Limerick end up going with a second team because their mind would be on Clare? And that kind of degrades the league a little bit as well, if that happens. A little bit, yeah. Um, but I can understand the position of both teams. Like if Liam Cahill decided to go with a, call it an 80% team and, and have a crack at it, fair enough. Or if he decided to rest people. Um, I, I think the focus, like we're here now, uh, just after Paddy's Day, we know the league is not even over, semi-final and final race, but our mind is obviously gradually shifting towards the championship. So the management teams are in the same way. The league is grand. It's it's For, for most teams, they got the exercise they needed. Um, but ultimately, I think Cahill is going to be having full focus on on uh, all management teams have full focus on the championship, so I'd say if if there was more of a gap between games, you go full full belt. You know what I mean? I just think the injury risk is huge. I, I I can't overstate that enough because you know it's such a condensed time period that if you lose one big player, it could you, like it could be dramatic for the team to say one player could derail your season, but it could. <laughs> like you, like if what happens now? Let's say if 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 like um, I won't talk about Limerick because Lim- Limerick have an embarrassment of riches at the moment to the players they have, but like if someone like you know, Clare uh, had had to go to the championship without you know John Connell, for example, that because he got injured in the league game. That's a huge gap to fill for a team like Clare. Huge, even though we're talking about the depth of squad. So I think yeah, look at the league is it is what it is. Um, 
it has lost a bit of its romance, I think, over the last number of years. Like even more if you're talking about those games that uh, we were all part of, let's say, from mm. the last 10, 10, 10 or so years ago, and they were electric, you know what I mean? But the, the championship was far different in structure wise. It was the old knockout st- uh, structure, remember Leinster? So you had, mm. you had a long period of time between league and championship, so the, the league carried more weight. Whereas I keep repeating myself week on week, it's just so close and so condensed that the league just gets shifted and into championship mode. Mm. I do like the self title, by the way, of that uh, supporter who sent in the first question. I'm a Limerick supporter who's not quite gone native yet in Cork. So uh, there you go. They want to say anonymous, I presume, so none of their mates in Cork find out uh, that they're texting into hurling pods. Uh, the other question, as Murph pointed out, was uh, one that had come in from Tom Cullan, who was asking about the idea of the Munster Championship game potentially in Ennis doubling up as the league final if they're the two teams who get through. I noticed that all three of us kind of predicted that Limerick were going to be in the final one way or another. So stick that up on the Kilkenny dressing room wall that the three of us have given them uh, no chance this Saturday in Porky Cueve. Uh, let's take a look then at the rest of the games that took place across the weekend. Uh, I want to just get through some of the comments first of all because it gives a chance to reply to them from the YouTube from last week. Uh, Shane Power, who's also got his question in early for the members pod, which is a good one about uh, transferring in players. We're going to be doing a sevens team uh, from all three of us as well. Uh, but Shane says, can you ask Gail on the next pod if he's building an extension currently on the house to try and create a new bedroom with a statue of the man himself just to keep Johnny Glynn in Galway for the rest of the season? That is a random comment. So <laughs> let's just answer the question. Firstly, no. <laughs> Although if my wife had her way, she'd put extensions on the house for, for other types of rooms. Um, but uh, no, it's, it's funny you brought up Johnny Lim because we were just talking about this morning, like, and, you know, the, the news that he's back has created a certain, I suppose, energy around Galway again. You know, that it's, good, it's great to have him back. It's like, you know, getting someone of his stature, obviously, his size, his experience. His, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge boost to a team. Uh, whereby we've 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 probably been over the last couple of years to say we we struggled in some physicality departments in second half season Limerick so he'd be a nice guy to bring in and uh, land him in the edge of the square there in the square. Well, if you want more good news from our scout here, Mike L has said, "Tell Skell Johnny Glynn scored three two against Patrick Swell when he was playing with our Ratten recently in one half of hurling in a challenge game." I'd believe it, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Now that's that's good statistics there. Thank you for that. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's what uh, our Ratten did. Our Ratten pumped him. Uh, like an awful lot of club teams nowadays like are trying to emulate the county game and play a short ball, work through the lines, etc. But Ardrahan, I like their style. Look, Derek Fahey's in goals, Johnny Glynn was full forward, A to B. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. It's the quickest, yeah. <laughs> Everyone spread out. <laughs> so yeah, I can see how he got 3-2. A word of caution, though, from Alan Fit 77 on YouTube. Not sure about this Johnny Glynn comeback. Mike Casey must be one of the smaller fullbacks, and yet Glynn didn't win a single ball against him when they marked each other in 2018 in the All-Ireland Final. He was much younger and had more hurling in him back then. Is this a masterstroke, or is it a sign of desperation, Paul Murphy? Ooh, desperation. Oh, ah, yeah, no. Yeah, that, 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 that's a bit heavy. No, like, I mean, it's, it's a case of that... Uh, it's, it's, it's not desperation, anyway. I think Henry Shefflin's looking at it going, well, I can inject a bit of experience in. I'm, I'm certainly looking for... You know that that added edge that could be a bit of physicality. It could be a case of an experienced player who, you know, has has played in all Ireland finals, etc. So, um, no, it's not an act of desperation. Like Galway, are, Galway are ticking over nicely at the moment. We saw a lot of physicality out of them at the weekend. We saw the likes of Jason Flynn coming back into a bit of form as well. Um, you know, a few lads coming back from injury as well. So, I don't think you know Galway. Galway aren't in a place where they're going. God, we 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 need a, a hail mary of a player coming back to to salvage us. It's a kind of a case of it's a welcome addition that Henry's going. Geez, absolutely. You know, if 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 a player of Johnny Lynn wants to come back in, there's certainly some space for him in the dressing room. Albeit he has to compete for his position. Mm-hmm. River Power with a bit of praise for Paul Murphy from last week as well. Paul Murphy was excellent on the referee issues he was talking about. Insightful, balanced, and fair. Well, there you go. The compliments are enough. For you, you have to, <laughs> yeah. yeah, may as well tell them while you have them. Um, <laughs> the other bits and pieces I know there's definitely one here on Limerick and Galway, uh, so we can get on to it now in a second. Uh, but Sean <laughs> was saying on YouTube as well. I know you were speaking about officiating last week, but the ref in Limerick Galway uh, deserves a mention as well. There was a dirty stroke on Lynch, the elbow on O'Connor, a hatchet on O'Casey. Hard to understand that there were two yellows, not two reds. Uh, he's also saying that he's fine with the O'Neill red card moments earlier. But he said Mike Casey had his helmet ripped just before that as well. So I don't know. Um, Skell, to give you a first shout because we all saw this on the on the telly at the weekend. Yeah. I, like, first of all, are any of us disagreeing with the red card? No, oh, it, it's very hard to disagree with that. To be honest, though, that was a blatant pull of the helmet. Yeah, you know, borderline headlock job. I, that's. I think now 
the, the, first of all, the officials do well to catch it. And I think he took the appropriate action. But I, I'm like, I'm not, I know there's a couple of incidents that you, you, you mentioned there from one of the viewers or listeners, but uh, like, I agree, there probably should have been another red, <laughs> to be fair. Like, I think Daily Work and Conference are very lucky that he got, that, uh, that he got away with that strike. Um, but I, I didn't think the ref did a bad job, let's, like, in fairness, I thought he did okay in that game. I know there's probably, we'll talk here and there's probably an instant or two that that is missed, but we've the benefit of replays. We always say this, guys. I, th- I, th- I thought he did okay. I can't argue mm. too much. Like, I thought it was a balanced enough game. He gave freeze and they're supposed to be freeze. You know, he wasn't over technical. So he didn't let the game boil out of out, out of control. So I think fair, kudos to him. I know we give referees hard times at times, but it's obvious, it's uh, it's good to give praise to him as too. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree. And I would hope that we're reasonably balanced on this pod as well. Because one thing I saw last week were a few kind of baffling decisions after we had recorded. So someone sent me on a couple in the, the Carlo Down game. And it, sometimes it does leave you scratching your head. Like in that game, in the end, Down qualified for the semi final, so it's probably not going to matter. But in the Carlo game, their full back was sent off for a pull down that was never a pull down when you look yeah. at the replay of it. So that was a huge, like, double jeopardy yeah. moment where there's a penalty given and a black card when he didn't touch him. And the other one was when the Down centre half back went through at one point. Uh, definitely did not overcarry, struck the ball over the bar and the referee had pulled him back for overcarrying. And obviously that's 1-1 one, one of a difference within the game. So you're kind of disappointed when you see maybe those inconsistencies or bad calls like that. And I think it's fair enough for us to say, look, that's below the standard that we'd be hoping to see. But at the same time, I, I hope anyway, Murph, and you were you were called balanced in your comments last week, <laughs> that we, we wouldn't go in too hard on them. Like, I don't think we're here trying to be too hard on refs. No, no, that that's it. Like, I mean, uh, like refs. I think I, I know people say, look, um, maybe they f- they fall into a different category than the players. But he, like, we come on every week saying the player might have had a bad game and the player had a good game. Like referees, you know, also fall in that to that category for me. And that you know, referees are going to have a bad game. They're going to have good games as well. And they don't they don't intentionally go out to have bad games, but it happens. And like, I mean, they're open to criticism as well. But as long as the criticism is fair and it's not targeted against anyone, I actually had it down as well. To be fair, I know some people might go mad as well, but. I had it down to Thomas Walsh actually had a had a good game against Galway and Limerick, albeit that I'd agree with Skettle there. There probably should have been more red cards, but when you take each of them as an isolated incident, like he probably needed the shoulder. Who was the shoulder on again um, when Galway man hit it? Aidan Tui. Was that who it was? Aidan Tui uh, um, went in on the young cornerback from Limerick. His name escapes me. Is it, is it O'Connor? O'Connor? Yeah, Fergal yeah, O'Connor. O'Connor. Mm. So it's Fergal O'Connor. Like I think Thomas Welch kind of needed his linesman there to to maybe give him a steer because that one was a bit more of you know two he had a chance to line him up there. Whereas oftentimes we see other tackles where a player comes out of let's say uh, uh, like a rook and he gets hit in the head with a shoulder, but the player who gave the shoulder didn't have time to to um, to adjust his body position. There was a chance for two he kind of. Yeah, you know, he went in high enough. If that was a red card, I don't think there could have been any arguments. And again, Dahi work. I would say, you know, he was he was lucky there that he didn't get more than it. The thing I'd say about that is that it was a fleeting moment where we saw the slowdown of it. Again, Thomas Welch is coming from where maybe Dahi Burke is actually or Davy Burke, sorry, Davy Burke, yeah. Davey Burke is um, has his back to the referee. Maybe maybe Thomas Welch doesn't see it, and that's the thing that I'd give slack to the referee on is that you know that was a very physical game. And there was like the other thing I will say is that I think there was actually the pull just before the helmet got pulled off. There, Key and Lynch did get a fair hard pull on him at that stage as well, which I didn't see where it came from, but I saw Hurl pulling fairly hard across his legs. So there was, I understand where Limerick fans are, well, particularly more Limerick fans would feel aggrieved. But oftentimes when I think when people are at the games, there was a few calls that I heard the Limerick crowd kind of getting on the back of the referee, but I actually thought they were correct. And there were small ones like flicks here and there. Mm-hmm. But sometimes when the emotion and you hear the crowd getting into it, oftentimes supporters remember the emotion as opposed to remembering the actual tackle or how it was. If the crowd rises up and you hear the noise, that's what you leave the ground remembering go on this call and that call. Now there was another one in fairness, like if you were to give it, if you're really be sticky about it, Seamus Flanagan got a good flick. Some Galway player, I can't remember who it was, came out with the ball. Seamus Flanagan got a flick and he flicked the ball away, but he followed through and hit the helmet. That, for me, should have played on. Seamus Flanagan didn't actually you know, injure the player there. He hit him in the head, yes, but that wasn't his intent. So I can understand where Limerick fans would feel aggrieved, but I would snap back and look at the context of it, saying that Thomas Walsh had a very physical, tough game in very tough conditions. Yeah. and He got a few calls right and he got a few wrong, but I think we'll all agree that over the course of any 70 minutes of hurling, there's going to be calls that are wrong and there's going to be, obviously, you'd hope more right. But I think, as we said last week, until referees are assisted a little bit more, you have to accept that you're going to get a few wrong calls. And that's just nature. But even, did, do you remember the two he won at the, the shoulder? Yeah. I, I fully believed in real time that that was a good hit. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. So exactly. this, this, this is the point we're trying to make, is that like there's our, our sets of eyes watch this in real time go, oh, that's a good hit, but then when you slow it down, you know, it's a bad hit. Yeah. So like that's why I, I fully agree with Murph. The, the support has to be there for the referee, whether it be umpires, lines, etc., because that's a very, very hard call to make, you know, to, to viewpoint. And look, we're looking at it from a vantage point, zoomed in, whereas yeah, you could, you know, there could be bodies in the way, etc. So yeah, look, but again, to re- repeat, he had a good game. Can't say much. Yeah. Uh, follow up question from Robert, which is uh, very similar to this. I will was at Salt Hill at the weekend just before Hegarty came on. There was a fellow beside me in the stand who said, "Watch now, he'll be pulled for something straight away." Sure enough, he was almost instantly called for a foul, which I thought was incredibly soft. So my question comes in two parts. Do the lads think the referees have certain players targeted for fouls before a game? And if so, was there anyone in their Galway or Kilkenny teams that they knew could be targeted before a game got underway? I wouldn't say from a Galway perspective, no one comes to memory straight away that, that you know, they carried, what's the word I could use? A reputation, I suppose, mm. that they were going to be uh, on the line in terms of aggression-wise. Would you I agree, w- before you get into it, that Hegarty does seem to carry that with referees sometimes? I think I think now it has, is in the last, probably, in the last year, it has switched. I think it's switched a bit. Um, I think, remember he got sent off in Innes when he he, he struck, uh, was it, Sha- who did he strike? I can't remember who he struck, but um, he got put off. It's, it's like from that point on, it just seems to have, you know, followed him a bit. And like, I, I like the way he plays. Like, you know, as Derek Nine used to say about John Gardner, like, you, you hate him, would you love to have him? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And that's the same way with Hegarty. Uh, I, and like, I think a lot of the Limerick teams, every every team does it. Every successful team plays on the line a bit. But from a Galway perspective, in my time, I don't remember anyone that way. I do think, <laughs> I'm going back here, I do think bigger lads get fouled an awful lot more. You know, wrap rounds. I, I do think Johnny Glynn gets fouled. I know I'm saying his name again, but I, in, in our time, he he used to get like wrestled and wrestled. And because he's so large, you know what I mean? Rest wouldn't wouldn't give the freeze, etc. So, but no, we, we'd know bad boys. We weren't like the Kilkenny lads. You'd no wa- you know walk in yellow cards then, Scal. Someone who you expected would get a booking from a referee. Um, I would, if if someone was running through on goal, I'd expect Dahi Burke, yeah. That he was going to go and, and, and dish it out a bit, yeah. But that was that was primarily his job as well as a fullback, you know. But I don't think that uh, I, I think as we sit here today, no one is ever going to say that Dahi Burke is a is a dirty hurler. He's a physical hurler, you know. But I was nearly certain he could get a yellow. <laughs> but after that, no, there was no strokes. It's a good question, and it gets you it's, it gets the brain thinking a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and even I'm, I'm going over to your side as well, Murph. I can't think of anyone in the Kikini teams. You know, did Tommy get a bit of it for a while? Um, I don't think so. I think what, what may have happened at different times would have been uh, if there was a topic in the media. Like, I remember, and I wasn't part of these teams, I remember around 2006, 7, 8 or whatever, um, I think like Gerlach Nan and things would have said that La- Kilkenny players were playing the hands, that were slapping his hands. He was stuff. manager of us that time. Or yeah, yeah. Seven. So trying Four to draw attention. Points. Yeah, exactly. So like trying to draw attention to things. And maybe other things would have popped up then, like... Uh, like ah, there would have been talk of Owen Larkin might have did we talk of this extra arm that he'd be well able to grab the arm when he's going through and draw a foul. We did. I, I, I would have noticed a few times where referees would have honed in on that, and when actually a player may have went in hard on him, they would have left it off because they would have thought that well they're trying to, I suppose, mitigate against what the general the general talk is at the moment of you know maybe Kilkenny getting freeze here or there. So I wouldn't have noticed any player though in particular you know, before they went out. But I would have noticed, like, something the referees would do is that if there's a big player on the field and there is a big personality, if any of those players dissent on a referee, the referee will usually, you know, not to say make an example of them, but lay down their authority by making sure that that player doesn't get to dictate to them, um, which is fair enough in one way. But, you know, it, it, it can it can lead to a bit of tension on the field between players and between referees if it's not communicated properly either. So, but no, I, w- I wouldn't say I, I ever felt that there was... A target from any of our players before they went out that they were almost automatically on a yellow card you know Tommy used to get away because he just used to play it off like that he was uh innocent in the matter that he, he didn't know what was going on <laughs> I, I'd say Tommy had a bit of charm with the referees Murph which probably helped uh, he did he did like I mean sure when you think back at Brian Gavin like in 2011 when he struck him on the nose like if you look at Tommy's face there it automatically changes like he's full of aggression pushing at the Tipperary lads and you know a loose hurl accidentally hit Brian Gavin on the nose but you see Tommy's uh, whole demeanour change as soon as he goes after striking the referee. And you just see him straight away. He becomes very passive. The face is blank. And then he baby face is on straight away. And he's thinking, right, if I have any hope here now, from Brian Gavin looks at me, I need to look innocent. <laughs> so uh, he had a good way about him. He had a good way about him. Is there any other hurler nationally? Now that you asked the question, we, we're giving examples of Gold Kinney that you think 
as that kind of I, I hate to use the word reputation, but do you know what I mean? Um, what did Ronnie yellow card before they go out like or <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose, yeah. Yeah. That they can be over physical or over, you know, complimentary of the hurry. Oh, I I don't want I, I can't think of anyone to be honest. No, I, I see it's it, it's monitored so much in the game at the moment. I don't think players have this ability to be um be you know, be be putting in a dig here, or there, putting in a sly. You know, there's there's you're, you're caught, you're caught straight away. Like if anything, managers I think are advising lads not to be get sent off stupidly. But if you go back twenty years ago, I think there was a bit more scope there for players to be um, to have a bit more of a dig off the ball or to you know, like I mean, there just wasn't the coverage at the time. There wasn't as many cameras. Um, certainly not in the big games anyway. So I think you know, it's if there far was, it's probably far more apparent in club games. Oh yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. In club games, yeah, absolutely. Uh, John, okay. Johnny Maher comes to mind. <laughs> Jesus Christ, yeah. That was... Sure, Jesus Christ. That was carnage. <laughs> That's an applicable word, I have to say, carnage, yeah. <laughs> he was cutting pistols with a hurl. <laughs> right, so the games we had the weekend, bear in mind, we had only the one game of the TV, so we're relying on reports and what we saw on League Sunday for some of these fixtures. But the game that we did get to see, 17 points apiece between uh, Galway and Limerick. We've already mentioned that Limerick hurled a lot of that game a man down after Shane O'Brien got that straight red card for the pull of the helmet. Mm. But I suppose Limerick would be obviously happy enough. They got through unbeaten. They fought back in the game. They didn't quite win it. But in the end, Dermot Burns with five frees after he came off. Adam English scored five points in play. Uh, Hannon got back onto the field. You've got Sean Finn now coming back to the four as well, Murph. Like overall, this has probably been a regular section of the league and a performance on Saturday that overall John Kiley would probably be happy enough with. He's got to see plenty of hurlers as well. I will, and I think he'll be happy with the likes of. I mean, Fergal O'Connor. Uh, I suppose we haven't mentioned him yet. He had a great game, corner back, um, and you know, I think a lot of people will be looking, talking about how many players they have to play in the full back line or the half back line. But nevertheless, they still have players still put the hand up, and it, you know, I think he's put himself out there as that. Well, if, if John Kiley needs to be needs to call on someone that he has a really tenacious corner back there who just does his job really well. Plays from the front, you know, it's really, really refreshing to see. It comes out with a with ball, but always looks to have a good option or or, or, or use a good option when he um when he has the ball in hand. I think we're really happy with Adam English as well. Um, like when you consider mm-hmm. Seamus Flanagan and Aaron Gillan weren't, you know, Gillan was marshaled really well at the start of the game. But when, when those boys maybe weren't getting traction in the forward line, Adam, Ling- Adam English pops up with five points, which is huge, you know. So, And I think that is something where we've seen that there is scope around that full forward position for Limerick where that has been a movable option where that, you know, uh, John Kiley does adapt that a position depending on what he needs on the field. And if he's looking to go, right, well, I have Galan is going to start. Um, you know, you'd imagine Peter Casey is going to start as well. Seamus Flanagan, you know, we've seen on and off sometimes where he doesn't get traction in a game. John Kiley can use that as a position where he puts in someone else. Adam English, I think, has put himself up there as well. We haven't even mentioned Dunico Dalek, who had a really good league as well. So I think all in all, coming through to this stage, John Kiley would be really happy. I, th- I think David Reedy as well. He was actually really good as well. Another player playing midfield, I thought, actually did really well as well. So, I mean, absolutely. Th- there's no reason in Limerick to, to be... Um, to be disappointed or to be picked out anything at all. Sean Finn coming back, injuries are fairly minimal. It's a it's a perfect position for Limerick. Mm. Skell, if I could ask you about Carl O'Neill, he switches over a little bit here with Hannon coming back in at six and we had a couple of weeks of discussion about how he was getting on at six in his uh, first two games there. I, I'm wondering, is the half-back line the plan for him here? Um, I think he's a bit like what Liam Cahill said about Seamus Kennedy, like putting out fires. I'm not going to say putting out fires, That's, that sounds a bit drastic, but like he certainly... He, he's he has the talents to play everywhere, you know. Mm. Bear, bear the full back line, obviously. I think he can play anywhere from five to fifteen. And like he's shown, he's shown. We obviously we've come to know him predominantly in the half forward line, particularly at eleven, even in Keen Lynch's absence. But he seems that he can operate everywhere. And like it's like the principle of the Limerick team at the moment. They can all play universally. They can all play in each other's each other's positions. And it's the kind of game model they have that you, you can envisage. Jim and Burns in the forwards. You can put Keen Lynch in the backs. So they're all playing a. a an excellent ball to hand running and through the lines. They They're love fa- converting a forward into a defender under John Kiley as well. Yes, that has been done and has, it's done very successfully as you can as, as, as we've all seen. Um but it's like it's just when Murphy you were talking about um not to shift away from Connor Lee but O'Connor, like it's gonna be hard for him, to, you know, he's had a, he's had a good league in fairness to the kids, like but he's not gonna be on the team. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's yeah. that's the, that's probably a hard pill to swallow for them, like you know. And the question is is where is Connor Neal going to be needed? Like so if if Kyle Hayes returns 
you know, you'd imagine he's going to win the halfback line. You've got Darren Morris to come back. Darren Morris to come back. Like, as I said, they have an embarrassment. The riches, like, we'd probably see Kyle Hayes up in the forwards. You know what I mean? Um, and it's it's just it's amazing to me to think that you could have someone like a Seamus Flanagan not playing. Do you know what I mean? Like, who, who will get on every other team in the, in the country, but potentially, I'm just using him as an example. Um, and I think O'Neill, I don't think he features in the in the full forward line. Um, I think he features probably 10 to 12. I think that's, that's what will revert to type come, come, come championship time. But, like, he's had a good league as well. Like, he's, he's for him to get kind of moulded into a half-back line player over the last couple of weeks, probably played most of his life in the forwards. Like, he's done very well against top-class inter-county forwards. So, like, I again, he can be, if you're John Kiley, as much saying, looking at your group, you're saying, like, we've we've got a solid group. They've got a solid 25 as well. It's actually worrying. <laughs> but, it's, but here we are. Gosh. I have two questions for you on Galway, Scal. The first one would be, they probably won't be too unhappy with this. So, Conor Whelan and Dye Burke both lost the appeals against their red cards. So, yeah. without two major players here. Played pretty well. Got back. Salvaged the draw at the end. Okay, it wasn't enough to reach the semi-finals. But Galway are going off in a training camp now. And they'll yeah. probably be happy enough to do that pre the Leinster Championship. I doubt it really matters that much not to have gone through to a league semi-final next weekend. No, I, I don't think so. I think I, I agree with you. I think like, coming away from the game, I was actually disappointed. I thought we could have we could have won it, you know, uh, particularly in the second half. We did we did an awful amount of shots. Like in someone like Tom Monan, who has been excellent for Galway the last couple of years, just the shooting moves just evaded him the, you know, the other day. Like he had four or five shots that just it seems that he was they go wide on the left and then he'd overcompensate and go wide on the right. But another day that'll pop over from. But I think ultimately when you look at our league as a whole. Um, you know, we've 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 I'll say steadily improved, and I was very I was pleasantly surprised, if I'm honest, with the performance that we put up against Limerick. The first thing I wanted to see anyway was was physicality. Could, could we match them and, and even see them in times? And the answer for that was yes. Um, I was hoping the game wouldn't be ruined by conditions because, as you know yourself, in league games in Pier Stadium, there can be a game of two halves between who has the who has the breeze. So it was really good from Gaul's perspective that there was it was competitive. Um, yes, a lot of frees to give away. Jimmy Burns getting five, obviously. That's that's good. That's. He's done a he score last year in the Ireland finals. He got seven frees, eight points in the Ireland finals. So, like, that's well within his remit. Um, but I think coming away, I think I was, I'm happy to see Gavin Lee is making making a bit of a stride forward. Ronan Glenn, I'm hoping, is going to nail down a, a, a team spot. Brian Cannon got back. Cahill Mannion got back. So, it's like the group is beginning to come together now. And I think the training camp is probably coming at the right time. I don't think Henry and the management team would be disappointed if they knocked out of the league. I think they'll actually be happy enough that they get to go away now and work as a group together. I'd say a week's long training camp. Uh, is 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 like is worth a month's training sessions if you know what I mean. That collective time together to go through all different facets of game plans, etc. So I'm I'm happy enough. I won't lie to you. I'm happy enough. I know here I am. We're, we're knocked out, but I'm I'm still happy enough. And I'm looking at the Leinster Championship, thinking this is this is when we have to win. Mm. Well, look, getting to Division One A was the most important thing. Whatever about getting to a semi final, and, and Galway had that achieved. So mm-hmm. the other question was about Carl Mannion because I know you're a big fan. He came yeah. in, struck over four good points. Uh, he looks like he's back. He looks like he's sharp ahead of championship as well. And uh, good to get some game time into him in the weekend. Super. And like, <clears throat> Cahill is, like, we're just talking about Cahill O'Neill, but Cahill Manning is, is very similar. Like, he can play in a number of positions and like his pace is electric. So like he's, he's, in, he's, a, he's a supreme athlete. So that's why we always see him in the kind of the, the midfield, even sometimes in the sweeper role. We saw him against Tipperary in the championship last year. But like he's an excellent, excellent player. And, you know, look, every team looks at certain players and they say, right, if we're going to be successful, we have to have this guy, you know, at the top of his game. And for me, I think if Galway are going to be successful, they have to have Cahill Mannion playing, operating in the, in the way he did there on, on Saturday. Like four points from him is a good return. Like he's, and he's capable of that every day. So we've seen it before. He, he can shoot the lights out. You know, he do five or six points in play some days and then kind of go quiet. So the question is, where do you put him to get the most out of him? And it looks like they're probably going to persist him in the, in, in the full forward line because again, he's a shooter. Lads. He can shoot from everywhere. Um, and it's great to have that kind of Athleticism. You look at the way Peter Casey and Galan play for Limerick and Flanagan. You know, athleticism, the corners, pace, fitness, and and shoot from all angles. That's what kind of what Cahill Manning is also. So good to have him back. Great that his brother played really well as well, Porrick. So um, I, again, I think we have a nice squad. Yeah, like I don't think we have the best squad in the country. I think that's obviously for Limerick. Um, I probably think we're definitely in the top three or four. Anyway, I, I think from from squad depth in, in terms of talent we have. So it's just can we piece it together and do it right the day. Mm. A couple of other counties I want to touch on just before we finish up on the main pod for this week, Murph. And one of that is Cork. And they finished the league strongly now. They had a couple of close games which didn't go their way against Clare and Kilkenny, but then they wiped out the rest of their fixtures. They're putting up big scores. Alan Connolly scored six goals over the course of six days there in two games. So are Cork looking the real deal now at this stage? Yeah, they're, I mean, their stock is definitely rising. We saw from last year 
Um, they were a great team to watch. They had a lot of threats all over the field and they were getting their defensive situation together as well. This year now, um, yeah, look, they, they seem to be headed in the right direction. I think all teams, um, depending on, look, whatever way their results break down, what all teams want to do is kind of finish heading in the right direction towards the end of the league. And that, that's something Cork have definitely done. Like last weekend, when we were trying to predict between them and Wexford and, you know, Wexford unbeaten as well at that time, uh, we were kind of saying this could be fairly even. Now, I, I just about tipped Cork, but, you know, Cork completely blew Wexford out of it and, and in Wexford Park as well, which is a, is a good achievement in, in tough conditions. So, look, Cork are definitely headed in the right direction. Alan Connolly, I mean, getting so many goals like that over the last two weeks um, with the likes of Declan Dalton coming back. And in general, they've been fairly balanced in terms of their attack and threat, like 12 scores over the weekend as well. In a bad weekend, I mean, I know we keep harping back to it, but a bad weekend in terms of conditions, like that's brilliant. Kieran Joyce getting the first point after 15 minutes, or fifteen seconds uh, from centre-back, a lad who could always pop up with a score. So I think they'll be really happy. Um, and, and not too many people talking about them still, which is, again, a, a, a place where they'll be happy. Um finishing up the, the rounds of the league that, you know, their stock is rising. They've done a lot really well. Yes, they haven't been perfect, so they have things to improve on. But heading into a Munster Championship, they look really fresh and they look like they know what they're about and they're hurling with a lot of confidence. So I think that, that makes a very potent mixture for Cork for the Munster Championship. <clears throat> and as neutrals, I think it's a great place to have a Cork team coming into a Munster Championship. Yeah. The other one uh, is Waterford scale, and this feels a bit like Groundhog Day, but obviously another defeat. And again, in a situation in the second half where they needed scores and they were chasing the game and Kilkenny kept them at arm's length and they scored just four points in the second half. Now, you have to look at the record here that Davy Fitzgerald has over the 10 games for the last two years. He's won three league games. They've beaten Leash Offley and Antrim and lost everyone else. They'll play in what's effectively Division 2 next year in Division 1B. They won one out of four championship games last year and... I know when Davey was talking to Park Lodge last week, he was saying that they've basically got five weeks now uh, to get ready for their first game against Cork. And that's time to maybe fix a few things along the way. But I don't know, is there any indication that things are going to be fixed in time for that first game at Welsh Park? Um, well, indication, evidence, the, the evidence isn't there. Well, the evidence w- w- would prove that, that um, you know, they're going to struggle in Munster, to be honest. We, we already know it's a, it's a hotly contested championship, like, and, all the teams, all teams of Munster at the, at the minute, uh, Bear, Watford are are playing relatively well, you know. So that's a tough proposition. But I, I, if I was in the Watford dressing room right now, I, I'd struggle to find confidence. If you know what I mean, I'd struggle to find the the, the belief that we're going to actually contest the Munster Championship, try and win the Championship, etc. Because the evidence is just hasn't is not there. Um, and I think like he's look. I know we've had we've had our fair share of talking points about with Davy and his management team uh, in. Over the, over the last number of years, but he's under pressure. Like he's under serious pressure in, in, in water at the minute, and I don't think there's any, you know, positivities around them at the moment. It's ha- it's hard it's hard to see how the public in water would grasp onto any kind of positivity because the results just aren't there. Like ten scores against Kikini, you know, that's that's, that's a better term at home. Like and if, and if you consider, you know, that uh, that it's it's how, how do I put this? New stadium, new pitch. You know, getting back home, win your two, home games. The two goals are giving them a decent platform early enough in the game as well. And it is, yeah. And like winning at halftime, a couple of points at halftime, but then, then it's just kind of really, you know, it, it just it just fell, it fell it fell asunder really. Let's, let's be honest, let's. But but like I was just gonna I was gonna catch you on the hop there more for a minute ago when you were talking about Cork. I was going to get you to name name the three that's going to come out of the monster. Yeah, just to put you on the spot. Like here we uh, go. And I think to be honest, when we talk about the three, we're really for me now. I hope I'm not trying, trying to be too negative here, but. I'm picking three out of four, I'm not picking three out of five. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I just cannot mm-hmm. see a situation whereby Watford, uh, and then here we are talking about the league, but turn it around a bit. You know what I mean? Turn turn this this thing around and and get the show back on the road. Um, I just can't see it because I'm I'm an evidence based man, and I just can't see the evidence being produced yet. I just I was hoping they'd go back systematically, just abort all the systems, go fifteen on fifteen, utilize the good players that you have uh, in their best positions, and, and have at it. But that it seems to be a continuation of same, if you like. So. Murph, I'll throw the ball over to you there, right? I'm going to get you to call the three Munster teams first. <laughs> Out of nowhere, you just turned it at me. <laughs> just to put you on the spot. This, this, by the way, will be quoted multiple times by fans from Cork, Clare, Limerick, oh God, yeah. uh, Tipperary, yeah. and even some Waterford fans, possibly, if you write them off entirely. So, no pressure whatsoever. Yeah, like, the only place I'm looking at at the moment is between <laughs> Cork and Tip. That's what I'm looking at at the moment. So, I'm saying that Limerick and Clare are going to go through. And then between Cork and Tip, then who is going to? And I like if you look at last year, Cork didn't get through. Really good team, uh, 
you know, just didn't get enough of those wins. Had really good performances, got draws and different things, just didn't get enough on it. And I think that's what could happen between Cork and Tip. Now, if you look at, I suppose, if you were to look at Tipperary at the moment, you know, losing Seamus Kennedy there through the injury, automatically you're seeing, right, if there's a very small things, I think, you know, a grain of sand is going to tip this in favour of one or the other. I would just about go with Cork at the moment on the back of they haven't shipped as many injuries as Tipperary at the moment. If you look at the likes of Seamus Callan uh, stepping away this year again, another potent forward, like Patrick Horgan is still there with Cork and still being very effective, but they can use him in a very, I suppose, a, a different kind of role because there's so many forwards that are coming through. The likes of Declan Dalton even as well there, if Patrick Horgan isn't going well, Declan Dalton is flying with the freeze. Yeah. Uh, I would just about tip it in favour of Cork there. And that's, that's <laughs> those are very fine margins. And even as a Kilkenny man, it pains me to say that you wouldn't have a championship where Tip actually progress out of it. But I just think that where Clare are unbeaten at the moment, they had a poor league last year, but still had a great, a, a really good championship. Uh, granted, they would have wanted to win more. Clare, I think, are coming into this in a really good position. Limerick or Limerick, Watford. I agree with you. I don't think they're going to they're going to fashion anything really into the Munster Championship. So for me, it just comes down to the two of them, Lim, uh, Tipperary and Cork. And if you're to go with it, I think Cork are headed in the right direction with a slightly bigger panel. That's that's my marginal one. So I'll say Cork there and Limerick at the moment. I'm the same three and I've picked Cork the last three years. So don't let me down this time around, Cork. <laughs> uh, you can get out of it. Scale, very quickly there, who are you picking as your three? I'm the same three. Hmm. So please, yeah, and people we've, put the, we've put the kiss of death on at least one of the three, by the way. I just, that's I just absolutely, mean, yeah. yeah. But well, one thing I will say is, like, and I, said, I know I said it already, like... It would be a pity not to have this Tipperary team in it because you know it likes a Garrod O'Connor and these lads not being in the championship for the rest of the way. But like that, like that is the good position with, with with Munster is that you know in order for it to be absolutely cutthroat, a good team has to miss out. You know, and unfortunately for me, as far as I can see, it's going to be Tip or Cork, and I just think at the moment it's going to be Tip. Similar, mm. but I wouldn't be one bit surprised if Tipperary. Came no. Out. No. But no. the first two weeks, the first two weeks were inside an awful lot. Like Clare playing Limerick first at home, and then Limerick have. Tip, haven't they? The week after, isn't it? Skell, you're throwing a lot of questions at us that you were posing the action. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're, you're also, by the way, this is a conversation we should be having in two weeks' time. <laughs> Sorry. When, got the, Sorry. when we have the down week, and it's like, yeah. what are lads going to talk about this week? Well, I mean, we yeah. can definitely knock 20 minutes out of who's going to go with the Munster Championship. So, know, we, we've um, done it already. We've done it already. Tell you what, yeah. so I'll, pa- I'll pause my call for Munster Championship. Come back to me in two weeks. Do, do, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, as we finish up on our Monday pod for this week, uh, the Division 1A for next year is Clare, Kilkenny, Cork, Wexford. Limerick, Tip and Galway Seven teams in both the top flights next season And 1B is going to be Waterford Offaly, Dublin, Westmead Antrim, Carlo Who are already in the 2A final And the winners of this Saturday's match between Leash and Down So both the finalists in 2A Will come up into the new division for next year A reminder of those semi-finals this weekend On Saturday you've got Limerick against Kilkenny At Porky Cueve, that's a half four throw in And 4 o'clock on Sunday O'More Park and Port Leash Is Clare against Tipperary Division 2 semi-final will be Leash against Down uh, Leash qualifying at the weekend in 2A Defeating Kerry Really, really disappointing campaign for Kerry going into the Joe McDonough. I think they've got a lot to do now at this stage to turn their year around. Uh, but Leach winning 420 to 119. Ross King with 1 7 on his 100 league appearance for Leach. So a great achievement for him. Uh, Fiona McKessie scored the Kerry goal very late on. It carried all the way to the net. Mossy Keys scored two goals for Leash as well. Uh, down doing the job to qualify against Meath on Saturday afternoon. They knew what they had to do because Kildare had beaten Carlo on the Friday night, 116 to 15 points. That meant that there was a five point differential. So Down had to win by five points or more to qualify. And Dahi Sands scored a hat trick for Down. Uh, they lost to Leash in Port Leash back in the first round by 218 to 17 points, but Leash did get a late goal. So that game is going to be hard to call this Saturday to see who goes through uh, to play against Carlo in the league final. So that is our lot for the first pod of this week. Uh, if you've been joining us on News Talk, I want to give credit to both the guys. The swear jar, the Tenerife Fund is in very rag order after this podcast. There was not one single swear scale. That was impressive. It's a sign of growth, Will, isn't it? It really is. You can you can swear away like a trooper on the members' pod if you want. No, but thank no, you to the radio I, I, listeners. I'll keep going when I'm going now. Yeah, didn't have, to hear, 
any F-bombs whatsoever, which is great. It makes the edit very easy for the radio team. So thank you for that. You have been listening to The Hurling Pod. A reminder that the members pod will be out later this Monday as well. For your ears, you're getting it a little bit early this week because we're going to uh, get probably a refresh on our cordial. Come back and do that pod now in a few minutes' time. We're going to be picking a sevens team, which is partly inspired by the football pod doing so in their great interview, which you should check out with the Clifford brothers from Killarney last week, where they picked a football sevens team. Then our friends over in the Premier Pod sent their hurling sevens team, so that inspired us to put one together. So on the members pod, we're going to talk about that. We've also got a question about what three current players you would take for your county team to make them better. I was not allowed to take the entire Limerick team for Offaly, unfortunately. It is restricted to just three players, so we'll be discussing that on the members pod and also digging down into the two semi-finals this coming weekend. It has been the Hurling Pod with thanks to Borgosh Energy. They are the proud sponsors of the All-Ireland Senior Championship. For now, Paul Murphy, James Skell, thanks a million. See you, lads. Thanks for it. OTB's The Hurling Pod. With Board Gosh Energy. Proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship.